One claims it's the company's only chance for survival. Atari has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The 31 year old. EWA presents the difference. Kodak is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. What's up guys, my name is Jake, and welcome to the 19th episode of Bankrupt. For those who grew up over the last 20, 30, or 40 years, or those who were parents during that time, then you'll probably look back on the family entertainment giant Chuck E. Cheese with a rosy sense of nostalgia. It was the place where a kid could be a kid, with their endless games, sky tubes, pizza, and slightly off-putting animatronics. It was the quintessential indoor entertainment brand that reached across the world and occupied a presence in over 700 locations. But it's also been a company that has struggled for decades. Born from a love of themed entertainment, which ultimately spawned copycats and fierce competition. They fought hard in the 1980s through an animatronic war, and were eventually the subjects of a corporate buyout and two separate bankruptcies, the latest being in 2020. So today, join me as we discover where Chuck E. Cheese came from, hear from those who knew the company best, and find out how, despite its very troubled past, it's still chugging along today. This episode of Bankrupt is sponsored by Nebula. Get 40% off an annual subscription by going to nebula.tv slash brightsunfilms. It all started in the mid-1970s with a man named Nolan Bushnell. He was the co-founder of the video game company Atari, which had seen a great deal of success in the early 70s. Nolan had a fascination in robotics and all things engineering, right alongside his obvious passion for video games. He saw the massive revenue video arcades were making during this time, a direct offshoot of how successful Atari had become. So, Bushnell came up with the idea to add in a restaurant element to the arcade formula conceptualizing a pizza establishment that merges both a restaurant and an arcade, a place where people can burn through quarters while they wait for their food. But it wouldn't just be any generic arcade or pizza place. This would be a family-friendly dining experience, and would be the instrument for Nolan to build out an amusement park-like atmosphere, harnessing the engineering magic of animatronics like he loved in Disneyland. This was all essentially a passion project for him, something he kept on the sidelines while waiting for the right time to execute his vision. That time came when the Atari company was purchased by Warner Communications in 1976. In that acquisition, they also purchased the restaurant concept Nolan had been developing. Warner ultimately agreed to build out this restaurant concept, and in 1977, using the rat mascot character the company had already been testing out, Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater had opened in San Jose, California. The restaurant opened as a large wood panel lined space, able to sit a few hundred people, and was filled with the latest and greatest Atari game machines. The numerous long tables with upholstered picnic benches occupied most of the center floor space. But the headliner here was the show space, where Chuck E. Cheese and his animatronic friends would perform shows out of frames recessed in the walls. It was kinda like a jankier version of Country Bear Jamboree in Disney. Except, while this was still intended to be for families, Chuck E. Cheese himself would be smoking a cigar and talking in a New Jersey accent, all while looking ever so slightly threatening. Regardless, Bushnell's business model paid off. Children loved the space and families packed in the large restaurants, using the 20 minutes it took for pizzas to be made by spending the tokens at the many arcade machines. Ultimately, a year after opening, Bushnell would leave Atari. But he still saw a ton of promise in the Pizza Time brand, especially given its early success just a year in. He believed in it so much that he bought the name and the rights from Warner Communications for $500,000. Nolan then set his sights on expansion, and he figured he can do that by franchising the restaurant formula, where he knew a few people were already interested. Robert Brock was one of them. He was the owner of the Brock Hotel Corporation, a successful hospitality management company which was also looking to expand. Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater was Brock's perfect business venture to pursue, and he became very interested in building out these restaurants all across the markets he was familiar with. 
So the two men signed a co-development agreement to build over 200 Pizza Time restaurants across the country. At this point, the restaurant chain only occupied six locations in California and one in Nevada. But Robert Brock's enthusiasm for the company began to wane, as he discovered what he thought was a better bet to hedge his money on. In late 1979, he was introduced to an engineer named Aaron Fetcher, who had just displayed his animatronic character show at IAPA. Brock was now thinking that Fetcher's work in animatronics was far more advanced than Bushnell's. Fetcher was also working on something that he called the Rock of Fire Explosion, a fully life-sized animatronic character band. Brock was so impressed by this that he envisioned his own family entertainment restaurant, utilizing Fetcher's highly advanced animatronics. So, Brock wanted out of his pizza time contract. Following a two-year-long legal battle, Brock eventually got his way, agreeing to breach their contract with the intent to build his own restaurants. The settlement they agreed on only stipulated that Brock would have to pay fees based on annual gross revenue for the use of the restaurant concepts for a predetermined number of locations. So Brock and Fetcher went out and built their own restaurant in 1980 called Showbiz Pizza Place. Their mascot was named Billy Bob, a large country bear that I think is probably equally as threatening. But despite being nearly a carbon copy of Pizza Time's business model, Showbiz was a hit. The full-sized, fully programmable Rock of Fire Explosion Band was a crowd pleaser, and dwarfed the framed animatronics Pizza Time was still featuring. With the immense success of their first location and a ton of capital from Brock's Hotel Corporation, within just a year, over 80 new locations had been opened. All of these introducing this new entertainment concept to new parts of the country, and thus quickly capturing and dominating that market share. Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater, on the other hand, was in a losing battle. Fortune published an article in 1982 showcasing the revenue between both these companies, with Chuck E. Cheese's restaurants averaging $250,000 less than the average showbiz restaurant. Though, interestingly, it also illustrated how lucrative these restaurants were, with Pizza Hut only making $320,000 per store. Chuck E. Cheese was even, on average, generating more revenue than the average McDonald's restaurant. By now, Chuck E. Cheese had more than 110 locations, and Bushnell was intending to expand the brand even further, hoping to open at least a thousand locations by 1990. He then brought the company public in 1981, and with this new IPO, he focused on chain-wide revamps to the structure of the Chuck E. Cheese experience, incorporating new, modern arcade machines, building new play areas for children, and most importantly, revamping their animatronics to better compete with showbiz. They did this by building new, full-sized characters in a new stage environment. We're growing because we've made it fun for the family to dine out together with wholesome food and entertainment in the most unique format this side of Disney World. This stock offering generated around $36 million in new cash. Though, weirdly, the company claimed that around 30% of their stockholders were individual parents who purchased shares on behalf of their children. They even produced annual reports just for kids. Anyways, with new cash in hand, Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time was in a rush to capture more market share before showbiz could. So, Bushnell continued to expand Chuck E. Cheese at breakneck speed, constructing and opening restaurants at a rate of nearly two a week. Over 200 locations would ultimately open by the end of 1983. But with all of this expansion, the company reported losses of over $80 million. The average revenue per location had decreased severely, and with mounting competition from Showbiz Pizza along with other new chains with similar concepts like Bullwinkles, the finances of Chuck E. Cheese were reaching a critical point. The video game crash of 1983 had made things much worse, and with the enormous debt from the expansion campaign and a sluggish stock price, the company ran out of liquid cash and was forced to declare Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It appeared that Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater had a very troubled future ahead, and that was if they can emerge from their restructuring. Pizza Time was close to losing $20 million a month, and soon after, Alan Bushnell had resigned as CEO. 
it appeared that Chuck E. Cheese was headed for Chapter 7, that being the final chapter for the company. But then, in a pretty shocking turn of events, Chuck E. Cheese's very competitor, the chain that essentially stole their idea and expanded well beyond their initial reach, had returned. In 1984, Robert Brock and the now successful chain of Showbiz Pizza had offered to buy the entire company for $35 million. With basically no other option and Alan Bushnell now gone, the offer was accepted. The two brands were merged, and the new parent corporation became Showbiz Pizza Time Incorporated. While this was a pretty shocking turn of events and showed the strength of their corporate power, in reality, Showbiz was also struggling, as the market conditions didn't just apply to Chuck E. Cheese. But Showbiz was cash-rich and in a much better place, so they scooped up their largest competitor, and now the company was poised to dominate the family restaurant market. In the following years, Brock would depart from his own company, and a new CEO was brought in to manage the future for the two brands. Or really, I guess his job was more to keep them from falling apart. Showbiz Pizza Time was bleeding money, they were unable to pay leases, interest payments were barely being met, and they diverted all revenue just to make payroll. Over 100 locations would close between both brands during this time. And remember, the Brock Hotel Corporation was also under this umbrella, and also in financial trouble. Ultimately, outside capital investment was injected into the company, and their debt was refinanced to shave off more than half of it. By the mid-80s, a focus was put on the customer and how they experienced showbiz and Chuck E. Cheese. The quality of food was drastically increased, as was the quality of service families would receive. Lighting was increased, as were the number of windows to make the space feel more alive and less dark and dingy. Really, a bunch of new customer satisfaction initiatives were introduced during this time, as marketing now shifted away from the animatronic characters and more to how all members of the family can now have fun. This allowed new life to be breathed into the chain, and customers took notice. By 1988, the company was spun off into its own entity and away from the Brock Hotel Corporation. By now, the brands were moving towards a unification, knowing that the agreement between them and the company that produced the animatronics for Rockafire Explosion was coming to an end. New stages were now being fitted into the Chuck E. Cheese locations, the first non-balcony animatronic stages yet. By 1990, the plan was coming together, and it made sense to pick one of the two brands to focus on for marketing and brand reach. Ultimately, Chuck E. Cheese was the stronger of the two brands, and over the next two years, all of the existing showbiz pizzas were rebranded into Chuck E. Cheese. This essentially marked the end for the showbiz pizza name. The Rockafire Explosion animatronics were then reskinned to the characters of Chuck E. Cheese and Friends, many of them becoming the Munch's Make Believe Band. By the end of 1993, the corporation had over 325 locations across North America. And while revenue fell a bit this year compared to the resurgence it was seeing through the early 90s, it didn't deter the company from continuing to remodel their locations and focus on child safety policies, including the novel concept of banning smoking in their family-oriented locations. Wow! While this was a step in the right direction for cleaning up their in-store atmosphere, alcohol was still on the menu for adults, which probably fueled an uptick in violence at their locations. Though on the upside, free attractions were also being added, like the Sky Tubes, an elaborate series of tunnels for kids to traverse through. Really, an addition that seemed necessary for all of their locations to better compete with rivals like Discovery Zone and McDonald's. Things were beginning to turn around in a very positive way for the corporation. By 1998, they had finally changed their name to better reflect their overall brand, now becoming CEC Entertainment. Revenue was on the rise, surpassing $370 million, and investors took notice of their long-term vision and the work that had been done to bring the company back up from the verge of bankruptcy. Meanwhile, Discovery Zone had gone under, 
a story I've already covered in its own episode of Bankrupt, and CEC Entertainment swooped in and acquired a great deal of assets from them. CEC stock had now doubled, and from the consumer side, a new generation of kids absolutely loved this place. Through the early 2000s, Chuck E. Cheese had huge brand recognition across North America, now with over 400 total locations. Investments were being made all across the chain, from new attractions and games to a new toddler zone, along with constant improvements to the overall customer experience. It was the place to host your birthday party, and for me, as someone who grew up during this time, I remember my time here fondly. Hundreds of thousands, even millions of kids all across the continent also happened to agree, and this all reflected in their overall sales. By 2004, a new company logo was introduced, while some locations began receiving updates. However, not all of them, and cutbacks across the chain began to be noticed, primarily in the animatronics, which in some cases had been scaled back with limited movement. All new and updated stores by this point were only installing one Chuck E. Cheese animatronic figure, while several shows had been replaced by what they called the Circle of Lights. Clearly, the animatronics were costing too much to maintain, and management had now figured that customers wouldn't care as much if they scaled things back and saved on the maintenance costs. In the short term, and in a lot of cases, customers didn't really notice in a way that would affect attendance, and the birthday party hub of the early 2000s kept a steady stream of net revenue, crossing the $800 million mark in 2008, just as they were approaching 500 worldwide locations. But through the recession, the company intensified their cutbacks and focused on implementing new premium attractions that cost money. They did this by removing previously free attractions like the Toddler Zone and the Beloved Sky Tubes. They were replaced by these new attractions, ones that cost tokens to play like bumper cars. By 2012, sales had begun to slump, losing around 2% of the sales they had posted the year prior. Corporate wanted to make some changes, so they decided to rebrand. Things then got very flat. A thinner wordmark was introduced, along with Chuck's mascot caricature becoming two-dimensional. He also became a different species. While he retained a similar appearance, he was now turned into a CGI rock star mouse, which also included a voice change. This rebranding didn't go over well, and sales didn't show any signs of recovery. Then in comes Apollo Global Management, a massive private equity firm that has taken high equity shares in companies like Oceana Cruises, Region 7 Seas Cruises, AMC, Great Wolf Resorts, and Harris Entertainment. They saw promise in restructuring CEC Entertainment to now better accommodate the revolving door of generations of kids. So they bought up $335 million worth of their stock and borrowed another billion dollars to fully acquire the company and take it private. As you might recall, this is what happened with Toys R Us as well, with an outside private equity interest buying up a controlling stake in the company. Just like with that acquisition, CEC Entertainment would also now have to take on the billion dollar debt load Apollo took out to purchase the brand. Not exactly the best thing you want to do when sales are slumping and just put on a billion dollars worth of debt. This was no problem though according to their new owners, as the company got to work figuring out new ways to boost profit margins and renovate locations. They also acquired Peter Piper Pizza, another family entertainment brand, and almost instantly gave it the same boarding logo treatment that Chuck E. Cheese had suffered through. Speaking of which, their logo was also changed in 2017, now to better reflect the changing brand strategy. That strategy came to a head that year, in the form of Chuck E. Cheese 2.0. This was a total rethink for the brand, essentially a clean sheet design approach, renovating restaurants with flat interior design and muted colors, both inside and out. Many of the larger attractions would be removed, as well as the beloved animatronics. In most cases, they would be replaced by an interactive LED floor display, Large screens would occupy sections of the wall, all while the iconic gold tokens had been switched for plastic cards, and the menus had been enhanced for better appeal to parents. I think the general consensus amongst fans and some consumers was that it looked awful. 
I tend to agree with that sentiment, as it looked very flat and modern, though in my opinion in a very ugly way, one that likely won't age very well. It sucked the remaining quirkiness or fun out of the design for these locations, leaving behind a rather generic looking family facility. And we all know kids love generic looking family facilities. You know, it was definitely a disappointing thing for 2.0 because I think it was ironically announced on their 40th anniversary. It was like, 40th anniversary, yay! And then here's our new way of, of what we're going to do. And it just was kind of like a big slap in the face. From a consumer, I would probably like the 2.0, but from a fan point of view, it's disappointing to see what's happening. Despite the negative press this new approach was receiving, CEC doubled down on it, continuing to roll it out across America, spending as much as $570,000 per location. By this point, Chuck E. Cheese had failed to pay off any of its debts, merely just getting by on interest payments. The costly renovations and high expenses caused them to lose money every year apart from 2017. And as the decade was nearing a close in 2019, the company had managed to keep revenue somewhat steady, approaching the $1 billion mark across their now 741 stores. Despite all of this success, it also meant they failed to pay off any of that billion dollars worth of debt. In fact, they were only adding to it by investing in the 2.0 renovations. So with their plans not exactly working out the way they had hoped, it seems that Apollo wanted to dilute their stake in the company and find new cash and new investors, all with the intention to bring CEC back to the public stock market. To do that, they made a deal with a British private equity firm who was going to merge CEC Entertainment into a shell corporation they had set up. The appraised value for the company was at $1.4 billion, just $100 million more than what Apollo had originally invested. However, by July 2019, the deal had been scrapped, and the hopes the company had for new cash to pay off debt had been erased, along with dreams of a new IPO. But even without all of these plans, the company was still hanging on. It would take a massive worldwide disaster to hinder the brand. And really, what were the odds of that? By 2020, the pandemic had forced the closure of basically every single restaurant they owned. Remember, this is a business model that is based around dine-in food, birthday parties, and arcade machines. All close contact activities, meaning they were forced to close through March. The company furloughed thousands of employees and took on massive financial losses. They scrambled to find uses for their idle locations, like utilizing their kitchens as ghost restaurants serving under the name Pasquale's Pizza on delivery apps. Eventually, the chain did reopen in phases, but with limited capabilities, focusing on their draw of pizza and other menu items to get people to dine in or take out. Unfortunately for them, most people don't visit Chuck E. Cheese just for the food, and the corporation's liquid cash was running out. And it was very quiet, very dead. We had maybe like a handful of people all day. It just felt really weird. It felt like it, it felt like post-apocalyptic weird feeling to it. With barely any revenue coming in, they had to meet payroll, make lease agreements, and make interest payments, among many other liabilities. They rushed to find outside funding and attempt to secure a large enough loan to keep enough cash on hand. But as they failed to do so, it became too late. On June 25th, 2020, CEC Entertainment had filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Despite the company being almost an entirely different entity than it was in the 80s, this was the brand's second insolvency. Honestly, it kind of took all of this by shock. It sent the whole community, Chuck E. Cheese community, into frenzy. Everyone was like freaking out. Everyone was like, oh no, this is the end. Everyone was just panicking. For the next year, the company continued to reopen stores as they navigated their way through the Chapter 11 bankruptcy. By January of 2021, CEC actually made it through their bankruptcy as a new LLC entity, declaring they had successfully paid off over $700 million of their debt and had a stable $100 million in liquidity. This also meant that Apollo's majority stake in the company had been diluted, effectively making Monarch Alternative Capital the new owners of the company. With the dust settled from this bankruptcy and their restaurants all across America now open and once again generating income, the company continued with their store renovations. CEC had also set their focus on international expansion, opening new stores in the Caribbean with sites set on the Middle East and South America. 
Domestically, the company still continued to operate over 550 locations, as well as 120 Peter Piper Pizza restaurants, the latter also being an area of interest for the corporation, as they unveiled the Peter Piper Pizzeria, a more mature and modern take on the same formula, only this is more focused on the food and has a fraction of the gaming space inside. It's still kind of looking boring, but whatever. And that brings us to today. CEC Entertainment is a battered company, and one that has seemed to have been on a noticeable decline for the past 20 years. But even before that, the corporate drama and the rivalries that ultimately formed the corporation that stands today is a testament on how great the idea really was. It was formed from a love of both video games in their earliest form, and the unique programmable magic that animatronics could provide to a space. Going to Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater, and later Showbiz Pizza Place, was an experience that you couldn't replicate anywhere else outside of maybe the Disney parks. It was like having your own weird enchanted tiki room in your hometown, celebrating your birthday with your friends and these characters, and playing in the endless fun that awaits you in their massive restaurant. Children and parents were both impressed and very often satisfied with the whole experience. So even after the corporate battles and takeovers, once all the dust was settled and the two competitors became one, through the 90s and early 2000s, the bots inside Chuck E. Cheese were still a unique and novel show to go see for millions of kids across the country. They became beloved by many and garnered huge fan bases who remember them fondly. Some sharing their experiences and boasting praise for the brand, while others archiving, restoring, and tinkering with retired animatronics and getting them going once again. It really is such a cool and lasting concept for so many people. But management was changing, and so was their priorities in what they thought the brand was. Cost-saving initiatives were then implemented across the company. Those animatronics and the maintenance associated were expensive to keep around. And I'll be honest, by the early 2000s, they were looking a little tired and ever so slightly creepy. But even today, there are still full bands that exist, like this location in the Toronto area. On one hand, it's cool to see this relic of the past, but on the other hand, it's looking pretty outdated. Don't get me wrong though, I truly do appreciate this kind of stuff. The animatronics played a huge part in what made the brand so successful. It was a quirky oddity that made them stand out. It was something you couldn't find anywhere else. It gave their locations character. Literally. But the problem was, is that management never saw their long-term value. In fact, they saw them as liabilities, and chose not to make them a part of the brand's long-term image, and chose not to update them in any way. The animatronics were instead removed in many cases once the company pushed their 2.0 plan. The result was some of the most terrifying images of dismembered Chuck E. Cheese robots left to rot in the desert. You probably remember seeing this picture, and all of this likely didn't help the public image of their characters. Instead, their locations were stripped of all classic theming and have taken on a generic looking, bland space that doesn't really stand out in the increasingly crowded markets. Remember, the animatronics set them apart and continued to be a novel concept for many of locations across America. When they removed them and created a generic looking space, what's really the point of going to a Chuck E. Cheese over anyone else then? Tons of competitors doing basically the same thing as Chuck E. Cheese have sprouted up not to mention their existing competitors like Dave & Buster's. So, the future of the brand is a little unclear. Will their modern take on the brand's image be enough to carry them through the next decade? And will that powerful name be enough to see success in other global markets? Since they're now a private company, it's hard to actually gauge their financial stability. I think the original appeal to North America's youth made sense, and positioned the brand as a unique experience you couldn't get anywhere else. But with kids today, I'm not really sure if you can say that anymore. That, along with the number of negative press stories, as well as the consistent stream of brawls that end up on YouTube, it really puts the brand in a depreciating state. But when you step back and look at all of this, it has been a fascinating and vibrant story thus far, with lots of people passionate about where the company came from. 
Some have done incredible work on archiving the past, particularly showbizpizza.com, who's been an excellent digital resource if you want to find out more about the company and have been a great help for this video. Them, along with the rest of these communities, keep the passion of the original Chuck E. Cheese alive and well. And only because of that community are we able to relive the golden era for this unique and nostalgic company. Perhaps it's the only reason why the modern day audience and kids are so interested in the brand. So now, it's either a brand that confirms the beliefs of these private equity firms and sticks around for the foreseeable future, or it's the place where the kids that could be kids have finally grown up. If you follow my personal account on Twitter, then you'll know that I'm a big fan of walkable and master-planned cities. Almost to an annoying point. I love master-planned communities and European cities that, in my eyes, are the best examples of what makes a great city. So, I have been watching City Beautiful's appropriately named show, Great Cities. I particularly love the story of Central Park and how it was created as one of the first major urban park designs, which emulated the feeling of farmland, with ravines, bridges, and meadows, a place that ultimately made New York City so much more livable. It's a fantastic and beautifully presented series that dives deep into iconic downtowns around the world, and you can only find it on Nebula. Nebula is a creator-made and creator-run platform where you can find original shows like Great Cities, along with many others from some of your favorite online creators. You can even find my channel, including all of my videos ad-free. My videos are also shown on Nebula a few days before they go live here on YouTube. There's also now Nebula Classes, courses to learn from your favorite content creators. All of this is included with a Nebula subscription, and if you want to get 40% off an annual subscription for yourself, you can use my special link nebula.tv slash brightsunfilms. A link will also be in the description below. Thanks for sticking with me on this incredibly long episode of Bankrupt, and there's so much more to come, so subscribe to the channel if you're interested. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.